This it is was, the OGM weekly call on Thursday, February 9th, 2023. Sorry, Ken, go ahead. I was, gonna say, I was, I was brought up by um, someone in Congress whose name I won't mention because there's so many of them. I don't know who he's actually called, but mm. uh, you know, there's, there's an issue of trust out there right now, and especially in institutions. There is this issue of trust. And uh, what you just said, this is a, it's a big issue, uh, good for lots of conversations, reminded me that uh, of my favorite Peanuts cartoon, which has Lucy gets her test in grade school, and it says, explain World War II, and then it says, use both sides of the page if necessary. <laughs> Um, and I think there's even, I think I found the cartoon once. Uh, oops, got to spell properly. How is everybody? Real well. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you, there's a, there's a beta that I happen to be part of for the new brain web client. Yes. Which is stunning in what they've achieved um uh can you like give your first opinions yes so the problem was that the brain desktop client was exceptional for those who found it resonated with their own ways of thinking and connecting the web client was not it just never kept up and they were able to rebuild a few years ago the desktop client from scratch and they have done the same thing with the web client in still like pre pre early early beta but it's a similar experience and yet also um new so in the sense that the thing that i'm most excited about and you might be as well is that anyone who has never used the brain would now be able to use it much more like a regular website it's it has kind of a pseudo wikipedia feel to it in the sense that it has navig your parent thoughts if any of you understand how the brain works parent thoughts are all now in a column down the side like a standard navigation of of you know classic old school websites and then you scroll down through the content area and then at the bottom there's all the child thoughts and they're all full text instead of the little snippet and it's just um it it just felt natural right away in a different sort of way and my i'm excited about it because i've been trying to think about how i was going to build a website with the content that i've been producing in my frameworks and i realized oh i can just pull a jerry and share my brain and and it's going to be a site it's a site that's just how it works and it's it's not pixel by pixel but it's content and navigation which for me that's great um uh, you just muted yourself by accident scott yeah uh or maybe not by accident no that, uh -huh. that that's it Thank you for that. Uh, Mark, any thoughts? And then a question for Mark. Um, I could do a screen share of the beta. Do you think it's OK? Many marks here. Uh, oh, sorry. Mark Trexler. <clears throat> uh, um, uh, I, I don't know if that would be OK. I, I don't know um, if that would be OK either. I would second right. that with Mark. Uh, just a couple of, of, of additional thoughts on the on the beta. What what the point is exactly true that hopefully this gives new users a totally different experience than they've been able to get before. And that's what many of us have been pushing the brain for for years. Um, now, obviously, a lot of people are immediately saying, well, let's now make the web client replicate the desktop, which really shouldn't be the goal. So hopefully they don't end up going in that direction. But now they've got one way links, which is a, hu a hugely powerful tool. Uh, in the desktop, they, that's now implemented in the web client. So it allows us to structure conversations in ways that we never could uh, before in terms of directing people to information. Um, and and the Plex isn't gone, just, just to be clear. I mean, you can choose to see the Plex or not in terms of the blue squiggles. Uh, you, you don't have to go just into the Rome-like website interface. Uh, 
you, you can choose, which is a good thing. Uh, I, will, I will note just in terms of the idea of, of extracting content from a brain into a website, uh, you know, uh, Pete and I developed that technology about a year ago. So you can, we can actually extract content directly from a brain into an actual website. So if that's of interest, um, you know, I'm happy to, to share that information with you. I, I will note that that just one quick comment about that. Thank you, Mark. Um, Jerry, your brain tends to be thoughts and links and not as much content. Right. Um, I was very excited about this because mine is more is is kind of half and half. And and now I'm I'm working more and more on the content side. And so that to me is it 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 fits really well with that. I don't know how well it will fit with your brain, but it won't get in the way because the plex is still there. Like, so it, I think it still works. Okay, enough about that. That's okay, Scott. Um, thank you for raising the issue and I'll just clarify a couple things for anybody who's not that close to using the brain in any way. Um, maybe two points to make. <clears throat> One is that funny enough, uh, the brain has always had a sort of an uptake problem where people look at it and they go, ooh, that's really cool. And then very few people sort of stick on the up ramp. Uh, and a lot of people just don't wind up making a habit of it. And I have an amateur theory that like people have very different kinds of mental representational systems. And uh, I don't know what the canonical or set of these is, but I know that mine falls into, ooh, that display makes my brain go, oh, that's how I think. That's how, that's how I envision things happening. And in fact, once I started using it, I would get into a conversation with somebody, not be near my laptop. And as they were talking, I'd be like, oh, that's not in my brain yet. And I would picture in my mind's eye, an expression I've always really liked, my mind's eye. I would picture in my mind's eye where it was going to go. And then I would make a little note to myself. And when I sat back down, I would harvest that or curate it into the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for me, the display was always like, Bing, and I understood why other people would be like, ooh, looks like a ball of spaghetti. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, but then there's been this interesting force where Mark, who has made a business around having brain data on climate change and all connected issues, um, he and also the inventor of the brain have been trying to figure out ways of doing brain sort of things that don't look like the brain, that look more like a standard web page. <clears throat> and I have, a, I have a, a thought in my brain about how uh, the desktop metaphor uh, and uh, Microsoft Office are kind of the tractor beams of death to innovative software, because people are used to Office and they've kind of they've kind of been trained on how to do like PowerPoint and stuff. And so when anything looks a little too different, uh, it gets kind of sucked into this into this vortex, into this uh, event horizon, and then often just gets killed. And that's my story of Prezi, a presentation software that I used to love to use, that I got pretty good at using, that I used for many uh, screencasts and speeches. And then they, they they basically redesigned Prezi twice. The second time, they sort of lobotomized it. They, they basically killed off the endless zoomable whiteboard. I could not get to it anymore. Uh, to do the thing I used to do with Prezi, so I've stopped using it. And, and it was a better storytelling tool than the brain was. So, so the, the one thing I wanted, the first thing I want to say was that there's this interesting sort of contrast between the brain as a display and it's in, it, and it, it is its own engaging thing and just trying to get brain kind of relationships and connections visible and usable to people who don't necessarily like that kind of display. How does that work? And I, I'm extremely interested in that as well. Uh, and in trying to figure out how to make you know brain data more accessible, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of that quest in like five different ways. Uh, Judy, question from you. Well, I was just going to pose as a thought concept how we might discuss the the difference between tracking and mining in one direction, going for depth and connectivity, which is what the brain more does, which triggers thoughts, but doesn't necessarily give you the dive. You get to choose which of 17 connecting thoughts might be worthy of additional breadth of information. And it, it seems to me we're dealing with two different types of knowledge capture and human behavior. And I love that we're developing the complement of doing the dive that's probably more user-friendly in some ways, because if you're not the person who hops from idea to idea, the brain would be difficult, <laughs> or at least a little challenging. Um, I love the brain because that's how I think. <laughs> but I think that the doing this in a bimodal and perhaps there'll be other modes as well as we evolve 
is really an important concept and thinking about how we might make clear those patterns of behavior for people who want to explore and sort of help define that would be a good idea maybe. Um, thanks, Judy. Um, I track most of what you're saying, um, but I use the one of the things I love about the brain is that it's not just an ontology of events and facts and things or a taxonomy. It's in fact kind of a blackboard that has a very, very simple organizational scheme that I appropriate in lots of different ways. So I go breadth and depth in the brain all the time. And sometimes right. I will just, and, and depth is metaphorically up down kind of is in fact sort of depth, but not really. Um, but but I can I can do detail. I can get pretty grainy uh, in terms of what depth is. This morning, uh, Leif Edvinson sent me a link about uh, Donna Zahar and her books about quantum management and higher. And I went down a brief rabbit hole, sort of following some of that. And I went back to a video I had seen before about about uh, Don uh, Don Ren Heyi, which is higher's management theory. I was just trying to understand it better. And that was like detail. That was depth. Yeah, you're, uh, you're right. There's depth there too, but you have to know how to mine it. And I think uh, putting it you, in the framework of, of alternate ways to mine it is great. Exactly. Um, and the brain doesn't let you hide the detail when you want to hide the detail. When you just right. want to tell a story and follow a red thread through the brain, everything else that's, okay. that's related shows up and interrupts the, uh, the, the audience, whoever you're trying to tell this to, and makes it more confusing. Part of what I love about the brain is that my approach to information is I find an idea, I look up the idea, I look up antis of the idea, I look up cousins of the idea, because I want to scope the whole field and test the premises that are involved in the basic idea. And that's, that's just how I think. And it's what I do when I'm on, online. So if I pick something, I'm not on there for five minutes, I'm on for 20 or 30, <laughs> because I'm exploring all these other rabbit holes around it. So I think just contemplating the different ways that people acquire information and what they, the purpose of how they're acquiring it is behind that also. So I think this is great, this is exciting. Which is its own large topic and super interesting topic. Just the whole idea of how do we, how do we discover things? How do we note take? How do we connect? How do we share? Every one of those is a, is a great layer to this question. And, and germane <laughs> to today's topic about how we choose what we discuss that could be a map that would take us a, a long distance into the future. Indeed, indeed it is. Uh, let's go Stuart Scott Doug. Yeah, so quickly as, 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 a, as a person who is not a technologist, I was listening to this uh, conversation uh, with a different set of eyes. Jerry, you used the phrase before mind's eye. Um, I love the phrase um, heart's ear heart's ear. Beautiful, beautiful phrase. Anyway, um, one of the things that Scott said early on was, you know, uh, has anybody used the brain or something like that? And immediately my mind went to, oh yeah, I used my brain back in 83. Um, <laughs> that being said, from there, <clears throat> I went to, oh, one of the things I've been saying of late is that uh, in the world today, we seem to have an epidemic of stupidity. We really have an epidemic of stupidity. And I thought that that might be an interesting question for us to talk about today or an interesting topic for um, discussion. I'm not sure where it would go. It might be fun to even talk about the instances of stupidity that we, uh, we observe as we look around uh, at the world. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. I'll put that in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to it when we've uh, tapped a little bit more in, in this first topic. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, Scott? Um, so topic idea, I'll, I'll expand upon it a little bit. Idea of a, a phrase I ran class from James Clear in the uh, Atomic Habits book, um, reduce the scope, but stick to the schedule. And I'm fine. I found that very helpful in my, my own personal stuff. For example, instead of trying to exercise for an hour or 30 minutes, you do a minute but you do it every time so that you actually reduce the scope, but you stick to the schedule. And so you build the habit that way. And what I realized was that was something that I was thinking about in a, in a bigger sense. Um, the idea of scope creep is a form of hiding. So I'm not gonna, 
you know, I need to figure out a website designer before I can publish my framework, which I haven't written yet. But I'm going to use the, the idea in my, my head that, oh, you know what, the reason I haven't published that is because I haven't found the right web design program. Well, no, actually, I haven't actually created the thing. I have, but th that's for the point of reference. And what I hear a lot of times in our own open-minded, very curious, uh, you know, wonderful group, what we'll do is we'll say, oh, well, I'm interested in this thing and I'd like to do X. Oh, well, have you thought about, well, what about, and then suddenly now, instead of talking about um, the rain in California, we're talking about solving the global weather and food and political climate problems that we have along with everything else. And it feels like, okay, well, we didn't, but did we affect any of those? even if we change an opinion. Um, and so that's my topic suggestion is this idea of, for those of us who are wanting to be action oriented, either in a grand scale or a small scale, does this idea of reducing the scope, but sticking to the schedule uh, make sense? Um, Scott, thank you. I am very attracted to your next, your other sentence of scope creep as a form of hiding um which i can empathize with way too much um and then we're hitting this kind of problem a little bit in the sense doing calls in the sense that we're trying to pick a topic to sense do uh, originally and we're getting somewhere we're meeting mondays uh at 10 30 pacific i think if you want to join us and please do there's a sense doing channel on the matter most but um when we hit masking it's like well okay how do we constrain the question to make to sense do something we can actually bound and and then one of the issues with masking is a bunch of people are like, hey, nobody's going to command me to do anything. That the, the whole broad issue of mandates is really big, and it's right there. And how do you address it in a way that connects to the scope of the masking question, uh, and 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 still doesn't let you like drift out into never never land where you're talking about monster issues because because everything is deeply intertwined. Um, and that's kind of how how it works. But I really like the the topic idea, Scott. So we'll we'll get a couple more ideas and then uh, narrow back down. Uh, Dr. Breitbart, you are muted. So so I'd like to turn around the telescope um, and um, the idea that that. Um, each person's internal mentality, perception, sensing, receiving, processing, responding, reacting to is different. And um, might it be really interesting to explore how to surface and make explicit that domain? So um, in working together, figuring out who's who's bringing what to what part of the elephant in a collaborative frame or context that there's a factor for those differences strengths and sort of weaknesses um in the way i process information versus the way you process information and um the way I organize and learn versus the way you organize and learn. Um, and this sort of like is also reflected just to reconnect to the brain conversation that the biggest challenge with the brain, my experience with the brain in collaborative context as a tool is, be, is that I need to drive because if people are just given willy nilly access to enter, um, if the conventions aren't consistent, if the tagging isn't consistent, if the, you know, um, and um, there's no way of surfacing 
and having a conversation about my experience, having a conversation with the uninitiated about that because the patience factor drives them out. Like, forget about it. I, I don't, I don't want to learn how this thing operates. Um, so I just wanted to add that to the brain mix. Um, thanks, Doug. And I think anybody on the call who in the pandemic was invited into a Miro board or a mural board to collaborate on whatever has has tasted the thing you just described, uh, sometimes a little yep. too viscerally. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I'm glad uh, I was able to join today. For Thanks for being at the start of the call. I love that you're here. Yeah, well, it does happen sometimes on Thursday. Um, but uh, I wanted to pick up on what Scott was saying about focus and scoping and, and maybe scope it even further. In my experience in the policy world, so often being in the right place with the right idea yeah, it, it is is so important. And sometimes it really helps to, to focus if you can determine where is the pressure point? Where is the, 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 the decision that's going to be made in the first in the next few months that you can impact? <clears throat> and it can be a corporate decision about a product. It can be a policy decision. <clears throat> it can be a procurement decision. But I, I've spent a lot of my life kind of following 17 different threads and then every so often i'm ready to just jump on something and just put 110 percent for a month or two gather the right team generate the publicity needed and and change the world you know you can you can really do that if you have the right people at the right time and the right pressure point and so that would be my challenge to the group is you know how can you find that and how can you be ready? I mean, it, it's this weird balance. You have to be like you, following almost everything, but at the same time, knowing when to play, you know, when to, and, and when to mobilize and how to get the resources to do that. So just a thought and uh, hope it's useful. Thanks, Mike. Um, is there a bridge that connects the scoping as hiding question to the epidemic of stupidity. Can we bring those together or are those really substantially different topics? Because I like uh, them, I like them both. I, lo I love the epidemic of stupidity, but um, the only bridge I see is that finding the right pressure point means to means finding the people who aren't stupid. And that's that's the the challenge. I, I, I and I when I heard epidemic of stupidity, I had to think of yesterday's House government oversight hearing about Twitter. If you haven't <laughs> read the Washington Post article and the New York Times article about this hearing, um, you need to. Uh, it was it was over the top. Um, either the Republicans have jumped the shark or I, I fear they've actually gone beyond the event horizon. They are now in a black hole of, of stupidity and there is no escaping. I mean, it, it was it was absolutely astonishing. There was no logic. They would say three sentences and contradict themselves three times. It was astonishing. So much to say about what's going on in Congress right now. Um, Ken, then Rick, then Mark Caranza. So uh, the phrase epidemic of stupidity has a nice, you know, ring to it, but I, I actually, there's two things. One, who's we? And two, the stupidity seems to me to be much more collective stupidity than individual stupidity. Um, Umberto Matrona says we should recognize all humans, even the least intelligent among us, are geniuses in the sense that we live in the coherences of language. We can coordinate our coordinations. And... Um, Collectively, we, we seem to have many structures that do not bring forth the level of intelligence or the people that make that up. Um, so I just wonder if we can set the acuteness of epidemic of stupidity aside as a label and dig underneath and say, what does that really mean? Um, is it Are we led by stupid people? Do intelligent people who come together fall into some kind of trap where they're unable to make intelligent decisions together, which we see often, but not always? So it just it it seems to me that it obscures a lot of stuff. And and if we're going to talk about that, I think we need to tease that apart and really figure out what are we talking about when we say that. 
Um, I'm going to agree with you and maybe reframe what you just said in that I think the label is cute and enticing in exactly the way you described. And I, I believe you have opened the conversation on the topic, right, in, in what you were saying, because yes, and let's like, let's dive there uh, when we come back into the topic. Uh, Rick, then Mark. Yeah, just to echo what Ken was saying, I was having the same reaction, actually. I mean, it's it's cute. Uh, it's really just dealing with a symptom. It's not dealing with uh, some of the uh, deep root causes. So uh, I would I would um, suggest reframing it in a way that uh, expands it out and looks at it from a more of a, a lifelong intergenerational learning process that we have yet to develop to co-create uh, and co-design an equitable, regenerative, and sustainable future. Basically, we, we just don't have the educational systems, the formal ones, the academic, religious, et cetera, et cetera, which have been woefully inadequate to be able to prepare us to deal with our wicked problems in the 21st century. So I think we have to elevate the conversation to the issue of learning, lifelong learning. Thanks, Rick. Um, Mark C. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that we're pausing in between um, speaking in this um, uh, round. Of... We are not uh, using the pause protocol, and we could. Yeah, um, but I wanted to echo exactly what uh, Canon and uh, I think it was um, uh, Rick just said, and I posted that stupidity as a phrase might itself be a stupid trap an attraction um, point to um, our own stupidity to actually think that other people are stupid and not us. Um, that's really stupid. Um, I want us to kind of tie them together with the notion um, of what I'm going through recently is something called dysregulation. Um, I can be dysregulated individually um, going through a situation where the death of a friend triggered something uh trauma in my life for the death of my mother and i didn't realize i was going nuts um dysregulated not you know dangerously so but just acting really really weird not sleeping um but there can be dysregulation mutually how the republicans and democrats can't talk to each other because there's kind of a mutual dysregulation there's not a way of making sure that we come to an equilibrium um, together. And that's not stupidity. It is not stupidity. It is not having the one ability to see that that dysregulation is happening. Number two, ability to pause and say, oops, oh yeah, we're actually talking past each other. We have to stop and pause and kind of like say, let's solve this dysregulation problem first before we try to do other kinds of problem solving because if we do we're just going to keep on hurting each other bonk 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 now um certainly um in terms of hiding scope creep a lot of people don't want to let go of oh no 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 we have to solve global warming now otherwise we're going to die no, actually, we need to solve the dysregulation between, number one, each of the parties on their own, where they're dysregulated internally, and number two, the dysregulation between the parties, so they can't talk to each other to solve global warming. That is putting, doing scope creep as hiding, or hiding the actual problem, which is the parties can't talk to each other because, oh my God, we have to solve global warming before we die. Now, um, I hope that um, was clear, concise, short. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment. I'll bring us back in. I'm really interested in scope creep around stupidity. And I think there is a nice bridge here in the sense of uh, Mark C, you just proposed a, sort of a thesis or a theory around stupidity. 
uh, that we're, we would be looking at the wrong issue. It's really dysregulation that's the issue. And each of us probably has in our heads a fully fledged or half fledged or fledgling theory about why these things are happening and what's going on. And, and one, of the, one of the things I like about there's an epidemic of stupidity out there as a teasing headline is that it causes those scripts to sort of show up in our heads and start lighting up a little bit like, oh, yeah, because this, because that. Um, and, I, and I'd be very interested in hearing from whoever feels they've got a narrative like that, uh, why or what, how that, uh, how that might work. So what I'd like to do is go into a little bit of silence and then ask whoever has a thesis or, and it doesn't have to be like a white paper with footnotes, just a, just a, mm, I think this plus this plus this equals something we could call the epidemic of stupidity. And, and maybe if you have it, like, and this is my thesis of the root cause, like uh, Mark was just pointing to emotional dysregulation. Um, and I'm, and Mark, I don't think you were necessarily saying that that is the root cause, but that if we don't fix that, we can't fix the other sorts of things. So let me go quiet. And I, I have a thesis of my own, but I will not go first. Uh, so I will wait for whoever wants to step in, uh, just break the silence and jump in with a, with a, with a thought. I'll jump in, Jerry, just because okay. it prompted a thought, and that is that I think what's going on is a, a attempts to escape reality in massive doses from everyone around them because of overstimulation, inability to see what they can do about it, um, leading to mass confusion and the epidemic. <laughs> it's a powerlessness response. Thank you. Um, anyone else feel free to build on that or to offer a different theory? Uh, hi, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Um, thanks for letting me uh, be uh, remote, <laughs> but and yet uh, available or present, at least to the extent that I can. I'm parked now, so I have fewer distractions. Uh, I, an image came to me when we said epidemic of stupidity and it was kind of like the reverse it was said it sort of said what would be the preconditions for insight and uh, presence in a conversation and how are those preconditions often if not almost always missing and high up on the list of preconditions is uh, safety so people feeling like i don't have to you know, drop. I don't have to do scope creep to to squeeze into this conversation. I, you know, I can say something half baked, and I won't be attacked for it. Maybe somebody will build on it. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a couple of ideas there. There's safety. There's goodwill. There's uh, the acceptance, uh, as as uh, someone said. Uh, I think maybe Ken. You know, everyone has something to. Everyone is a genius in a in a narrow realm that they don't share with others, which is their own particular experience. And the question is, how do you leverage that? Uh, how do you make it available to others? Uh, how do you respect it and then include it? Okay, just a couple thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, you're next, but if you wanna just pause a little bit between what everybody says, that'd be great. I had forgotten about the uh, new paradigm. I, I do. I do think that's very good to listen to the the key points from the previous person and digest it. Um, I'm going to build on a couple things that have already been said, but I, <clears throat> I I like the idea of asking, you know, what why do we seem to be surrounded by noise and and stupidity? And I I'm going to be controversial here and say part of it is we've gotten out of the business of believing in standards. Um, I'm a huge fan of Zen and the art of motorcycle ma uh, maintenance, partly because it was all about quality, you know, pursuing quality and you know, making, you know, your, your bike as good as it could be. And but just quality was a theme. I, I don't see 
equality being a, a theme anymore. And, and even worse, we seem to have completely forgotten ethical standards. Everything is about the law. And so you hear the Republicans, well, not the Republicans, let me be very clear, the MAGA Republicans, the Trump supporters saying, well, you know, he didn't break the law, but he was so far <laughs> beyond any ethical system. I mean, whatever ethics you believe, I mean, what, 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 what some of the, what's been documented, not, and particularly around uh, January 6th, it's just, just preposterous. So I, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd ask the question whether we, we need to raise the idea of standards and believing in standards. There, there, there just seems to be this idea that everybody's values are the same. We have to accept everybody's standards and there, there isn't any kind of path towards a better world because everybody's got their own path. Um, I, I do want to make very clear, I'm not saying there's a universal truth and I'm not saying that we can we can have a very concrete standard, but I, I think just as there isn't a way to know exact truth, we can at least know the way towards more truthiness. You know, we can we can get closer. And so that's that's my controversial statement. And, and I'm sounding a bit like the uh, old school moralists and uh, Robert Bennett, but um, I, I really worry that we're not teaching our kids to. Uh, accept some kind of rules to live by. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, I believe that Zoom shows us all their hands raised in the same order, just the, the sequence in which they were raised. So I'm not going to necessarily cue in who's next and whatever. So I think everybody sees that Ken and Stuart have their hands up. So if you will pause between, I will let us sort of self steer for a bit. Before I say what I was going to say, I want to mention how amazing it is to see Mike looking relaxed with his hair a little bit messed up, not in a tie, just sort of you know, like, Mike, I hope you're having a good time down there in Palm Springs. For four more hours before I go to rainy Seattle. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was having this conversation last night with with an old friend of mine that we've been known each other since 1970 and we talk every week and he's on the East Coast and um you know I said I'm I'm not I'm not one of those people who I love bumper stickers and memes but I usually don't find any that kind of reduce the world down but this one actually does this one this one is like I don't judge people on their political position or the religious position I judge them on whether or not they're an asshole and we're talking about we have, to Mike's point, not just lost standards, but one of the standards is you you um, you don't get if you're in a position of power, the right to degrade and diminish other people and to marginalize them. You know that's not a, a right that's given to you simply by virtue of attaining a, a position of power, whether it's in a corporation, an organization, a, you know, a, a government, um, or whatever it is, family, and. This idea of goes back, you know, to the moral of of the golden rule of treating people well, and I come back to um, the dawn of everything, and how um, prior to the Europeans' um, rise in the world, uh, in the indigenous world, chiefs had no power except the power of persuasion. They and often if they were seen as um, wealthy, they had to give their wealth away, or people wouldn't listen to them. So all they had to persuade people was their ability to influence. And to do that, they always had to point to what works for the whole. How do we make sure that the decisions we're making are good for the tribe, that they're going to serve us all? And that was their place of power to stand in. And I think we've got such an individualistic, ego-driven culture that we have forgotten what that's like. And that's robbed us of power, and it's increased the amount of stupidity in the world. Um, also, there's a... Uh, there's a huge focus on, you know, who's the smartest guy in the room, not usually who's the smartest woman in the room, but who's the smartest guy in the room, and we have to defer to them. And 
when it comes to the level of complexity we're dealing with in the world today, no one sees the whole picture. So we've got to be a lot more humble in saying, you know, what do you think? And 20 plus years ago, I read an, an interview with Michael Eisner, who was a CEO of Disney at the time. He said, you know, we used to believe that the best ideas were only going to come from the creative department. Now we know the janitor could have an idea that would be a billion dollar movie. So we encourage every single person, no matter who they are, if they work at Disney, they have the right to speak up and make suggestions. And that's something that I think we're really missing in many of our collective governance processes is who gets the right to speak. So simply um, broadening that out would help a lot in terms of dealing with our collective stupidity. And I think what we're trying here with the, let's pause and let what people uh, say sink in is one way to deal with collective stupidity. Um, just one more point I wanted to make. Oh, um, the idea of education. Yes, our education system has failed us, but you know what? People, for a very long time in our history, we didn't have formal education. We had informal education and apprenticeships and whatnot. And Paolo Freire wrote, you know, A Pedagogy of the Oppressed. There are many, many people in the world who have little access to education and yet they make wise decisions and how do they do that you know you don't have to have a phd from harvard in order to be a smart person um there's a story from the farm workers movement where uh it looked really bad for them the 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 farmer the the farm owners had you know outlawed any organizing on site and so uh they gathered in a church and cesar chavez says i don't know what to do I, don't, I'm, I give up. I've tried everything I can, and we're we're out. We're bested at every turn. There's a long silence, and a, a, an old woman in the back of the room who had no formal education. So I have an idea. You know, they can't stop us from from worship. Maybe we could set a truck up right outside the gates of the of the farms, flatbed truck, and put an altar on it, and people could come and they could they could pay their respects on the altar, and while they're there, they could talk to get organized, and that's how they did it. And so, you know, they can't, they can't fault us. That's our right for religious purposes. And, and that didn't come from, you know, the, the, the big CEO that came from a, a very humble woman who said, I have an idea and they listened to it. So I think a lot more humility, humility is one of the uh, antidotes to stupidity. If you ask me, just saying, I don't know, what do you think? Um, tell me more about that. Uh, I just read Ed Shine's book, Humble Inquiry. Ed Shine passed last week. <laughs> at 92, I think. You can get it online for free. It's a fantastic book, it's short, and it's all about humble inquiry. Of how can we how can we step back and, and really see and appreciate other people? Thank you. So I think this conversation is exactly where I would hope it would have gone uh, in terms of throwing out the notion of collective stupidity or whatever phrase you want to use. That was just a phrase to kind of <clears throat> engage in some ways. And um, God is laughing. <laughs> God in quotes, laughing. You know, look what I provided and, and look what you are doing. And I think we're we're kind of um, be an example right now about how any system starts to bend back on itself after a ways. You know, capitalism comes to mind and, and, and individual and personal freedom certainly comes to mind because um, look at what, you know, many of the people in the, uh, in the Congress are doing in the name of, you know, um, personal freedom. I get, I get to do this. I appreciated what you said, Rick, earlier about education, um, because I think as a foundational level, you know, we need to be re-encultured slash re-educated uh, in, in a different way, in a different, in a different um, mindset. Um, and, and the last thing that I wanted to say is, um, it, and I think somebody said this in this call a few weeks ago, you know, nation states will take wise action when they've exhausted all other possibilities. Um, the shit hasn't really hit the fan yet on a massive, massive level. And I've said this before. Um, and until that, you know, happens, 
people are still fucking around you know to use a a term a term of art and then that's what's going on now everybody seems to be pushing their um um power i think i read recently that um bp has decided that they would um <laughs> forget all their plans about sustainable alternatives and for the next 10 years they're going to just pursue fossil fuels again <laughs> You, you talk about if you talk about stupid action, you know there it is. <clears throat> but it's operating on a certain value set. You know they're doing the best they can within the 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 mindset and operating principles and values um, that are motivating them. You know you know fuck the collective. You know the hell with what all the science is saying. Um, we're going to maximize our profits right now, and and that I think is the is a a foundational edge. Um, what many of us are are, are pointing to. Rick, you you'll need to unmute yourself, Rick. Thank you. No, I just um, put a series of big, hairy, audacious questions into the chat box. And those questions are not meant to be read. Um, they're, they're not to be said out loud. They're meant to be read, sorry, uh, because it, it takes time to digest them. Um, and it, I, I just reiterated something I asked earlier about um, how we need to co-evolve lifelong intergenerational learning platforms for different purposes. And, you know, I, I think the, the epidemic of stupidity is, is a great um, sort of point to make a counterpoint. Um, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because it's problem focused and it's not really focusing on innovation solutions. And so I don't think we've really taken the time out to zoom out and really think more deeply about how to design systems. I mean, if you just think of the amount of money that's gone into designing artificial intelligence uh, in a very short period of time, if we were to really step back and really to design our human systems in a way that were uh, beginning to address the three questions that I put there, I would posit we'd get the greatest minds together and develop governance structures, simple rules, educational processes that would be able to help us avoid repeating history over and over again. Um, so my only hope is that there will be a, uh, a humanitarian technological synergy and revolution where the best of both sides can get us out of this morass. So if you want to read, the, I'm not going to read the questions out. You can read them in your own time, um, but it's uh, food for thought. Pausing. Thank you, Rick. That was beautiful. And um, uh, I agree. Um, people first, not technology first. And it's really hard. There's a syndrome that I'm running into with my relationship with Kate. Um, we call it in our pet language, too much Mark, TMM, where Mark is really dominating the conversation because he's really smart and he thinks he's really smart um, and he's not listening to Kate. Um, recently, I spent uh, a night at uh, 18 Lansing beautiful new apartment building penthouse that some friends have rented in Con Hill, downtown San Francisco. And uh, three guys, um, all in their 30s or 20, and um, me at 60. And they just had so much energy and I stayed up all night with them, which was dumb because I didn't sleep the night before. Too much mail. And I'm noticing that here on our conversation. Our own stupidity is not having more women on this call. 
I need I think we need to look at our own stupidity before we point out other stupidity. Um, and you know, my stupidity first, which is more important than your stupidity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyway, um, we're coming to the end of the call. Thanks for listening. I was happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And thank you also for reminding us to pause. Um, I use the chat sometimes to take notes. I just don't hit return. So I'm going to tell a quick story. This is my, this is my amateur theory about amateur theory to address the question of the epidemic of stupidity. Uh, as background, two things. One, I was convinced by Adam Curtis's documentary uh, uh, way back when that we are in a nonlinear war that basically information warfare is cheaper than bombs and bullets. And it turns out that Russia was really good at nonlinear warfare and appears to really suck at warfare on the ground as we're learning in Ukraine. But, but I, I was convinced a while ago uh, by hypernormalization is the name of the documentary that, that we're sort of in this battle. And um, I also believe that uh, separately that people, humans are really smart. Like people are really smart and some people who um, seem really dumb, it turns out when you ask them about baseball or quilting or something they really give a shit about, they have memorized everything. They know their stats. They, they, they like, you know, and, and, and people who are poor are really smart. Uh, most of us wouldn't last a couple of days in a favela or, or a slum someplace. Uh, we would die very, very quickly because there's so many things you have to do just to keep alive and stay alive and be safe in places where there's constant danger. And most of us live in little cocoon, uh, sort of bubble wrapped lives where there's very little actual danger present as long as sort of the, the cash keeps flowing through our system to keep all the barriers up. Um, but for me, like, I think that a lot of the stupidity we see is, has been around a lot, but it's strategy. To, to me, uh, I have a, another, another piece of amateur thesis is that the, the story of human history is a fight in the cockpit over the joystick of control over whatever country or entity you happen to live in. And the, the parties that make it into the cockpit, which are very few because usually we have elites who are fighting over the joystick, um, they each think they're going to they're about to lose. They each think the other side is going to kill them off and knife them in the back. Uh, it is a desperate struggle. And the winners in retrospect always thought they were about to lose. Uh, and all, you know, it's just nasty. And every now and then they run the airplane into the ground and kind of wipe out their society and bad things happen, uh, either because they made stupid decisions within the system and destroyed it. Like, you know, Mao and Stalin killed like 20 some million people individually through really stupid decisions. Just look at the four pest campaign in China where they basically starved, uh, you know, uh, possibly 10 million plus people because they eliminated all the sparrows, which had been eating all the insects. Um, so I think of our stupidity or our perceptions of stupidity as part strategy, because stupid people who are fearful are easier to manipulate. And there's a whole bunch of political parties that have gotten really, really, really smart. Um, sociology, psychology, anthropology, group dynamics, and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, hey, if we can keep people scared and afraid, they will grab, they will seize any narrative that floats by, and we have lots of really great narratives that'll make them even more afraid, uh, and that's what's happening. So, so we are in this world where uh, then then fold into this some new technologies that have shown up that lower the cost of communicating to zippity doo Basically, there's a there's a fixed cost of getting online, which is a device of some sort, and then a connection of some sort, and beyond that, everything else the, the cost is your time. Information freely is superconducted around the world. And we, and worse, the platforms, uh, not email, but the uh, the major platforms, uh, Facebook, et cetera, their business model is addiction and uh, stalking, basically data mining our stuff and invading our privacy. They want addiction. So the platforms are not designed to help moderate, modify, or change all of this. And they're designed to float like cute cats and uh, people's morning toast bread, uh, avocado toast and whatever else through, which makes us in some sense sort of stupider. And then 
Uh, my whole quest started 35 years ago when I realized I hated the word consumer because our world has been consumerized. And when we're treated as mere consumers instead of as citizens, we lose that sense of standards and rules and order. We lose that sense, more importantly, of interdependence. And uh, so this notion that we are in this little sucker together and that we need to sort of figure out how to, how to make the world better together or we're all screwed because this thing doesn't naturally drive itself. Uh, we actually need to steer together rather than be fighting in the cockpit over the joystick. And, and, and I hate that I revert, revert so often to the fight over the joystick metaphor, but I do because I just see it happening so often all the time. And I see actively the things that are happening on the street as strategy. And, and you know, Steve Bannon to me is a brilliant strategist and, a, you know, he's like pretty much on my evil spectrum, on my naughty list. But, but he is really, really, he's one of those people who's figured out a lot of these social dynamics and is busy coaching leaders around the world on how to use them. And it's working so well that in country after country, we are evenly split, you know, and, and, and a piece of this is what legislation do you create that'll, that'll buy you a victory, even if your stances are unpopular. And so Citizens United basically says money doesn't matter in politics. So hey, guess what? We, we're just going to pour insane amounts of money into politics, and that's going to help us win. And it does. So all these things happen because the ground rules that we've set are, are too easy to corrupt and because we've lost touch with each other and can't figure out uh, that we're together. Uh, one of the tools here is what I call denial of discourse attacks, which is, hey, I know that, you know, Ken, when you say we would like to, like, people deserve a place that the way to keep people from their place at the table and to keep winning the battle is to deny them the ability to talk, to, to do denial of discourse, and to make the arena for discourse so messy or painful or, or irritating or dangerous that nobody will dare tread into it, which means that when Lindsey Graham is incensed that somebody would 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 say something against Brett Kavanaugh and impugn his character, when when Lindsey Graham looks like he's about to explode, that is theater. That is pure and intentional theater to win a seat on the Supreme Court for a guy who very likely was a sex abuser as a young guy. He was certainly a drunken bro, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just a that's just a little scene in the theater of this strategic battle that's playing out at very high levels all over the place all around us. Um, and my answer to all of this is we need to figure out how to trust each other again. That's why the unfinished 2020 talk that I gave is called uh, Trust is the Only Way Forward. I say some of this there. I'll post a link to that talk here. And I think that everything I just said is a fabulous ex example of scope creep. Uh, because uh, I'm sort of saying that that the question we're looking at involves all these large scale um, social and political and economic dynamics in the world. Um, so that's my amateur theory of, of uh, why we're facing an epidemic of stupidity. I don't know that, I think that it's perceptual, it's temporary, but it's intentionally driven. It's like there's a bunch of people who are feeding us bread and circuses because being fearful and stupid makes you really, really pliable. So, Jerry, thank you for that um, really extraordinary exposition of more factors than I could keep track of as you were speaking that I think have, you know, value and validity and, and, and point us in a, in a direction. Um, and it has earned you, I think, the, the right to say yes or no, to write a short chapter in a book called Thoughtful Citizens. <laughs> Should you decide to undertake this? <laughs> Sounds uh, lovely. <laughs> um, before you, you spoke so eloquently, I, I, I was gonna say um, the biggest challenge, and, and I think everything you said points at this, I mean, a classic example, I just heard somebody talking about, you know, Republican strategy. Um, it's to prevent people from voting 
um, because of the current uh, electoral college system and the, 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 the number of you know, Senate seats available, um, that they're not trying to win general elections. They're just trying to keep power and control by gaming the system which is what I wanted to say. One of the great things that I took away from a number of talks that I listened to um, by Schmachtenberger um, is that there will always be people who game the system, no matter what you do. And this is why kind of legislation is not the answer. No matter what you do, um, people will, will game the system. And in some ways that's what Bannon is doing, you know, right now he's trying to play within the rules of the existing systems, but his value set in the minds of, you know, so many of us would say, oh, that's, you know, um, um, he's, he's operating in a, in, a, in, in a way that doesn't um, care about human beings. He only cares about power and control. <clears throat> so this is that in some ways it's the, it's the nub of the challenge we're on. How do you create a system where people act in ways that, quote, we would think are responsible? And to even add another layer of complexity, it may not be a democratic system that actually gets us out of the morass. You know, it, it may be more of, a, more of a benevolent, and I've said this before in this call, benevolent authoritarian system that, that, that can... Um, bring us out of the system. So um, in the meantime, what do we do? You know, and I can only answer for myself, you know, I'm latched on to a few projects that keep me with some degree of satisfaction. Um, and I just keep working it with no sense of, you know, um, fruition, but each of us has a piece of the solution. I think that that's a true piece that we need to keep in mind, that each of us has a, has a little piece of the solution. And so um, we, we just keep putting one foot in front of another. That's all, that's all, that's all we can do. And, 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 you know, and boy, if somebody's got a much better answer to that, <laughs> uh, I'm all ears. I, I loved your, your referencing, Ken, um, um, humble inquiry or something, something, something like that. Thanks, Stuart very much. Um, where does this put us? Where are we? Where would we like to go? I think uh, one of the tensions that arises in me around conversations about stupidity is that it gets seen as a threat and it can constrict us into, oh no, oh no, stupidity, stupidity, instead of what's the antidote to stupidity? You know, we, we've been around a long time. Humans been on the planet for a very long time. We only know a little tiny bit of our history. The fact that we've made it here through all kinds of things means collectively we've been pretty intelligent up until recently. So how do we, instead of focusing on, oh my God, we're stupid, what happens if we shift the focus to where are we smart? What can we build on? You know, um, I've had a lot of conversations about doomism and, and I've really come, I have no religion to speak of, but I've really come to believe in the intelligence of evolution. I don't think we got to where we are only to take ourselves out of the picture. It could be, we will do that. But I really believe that um, there is a larger native intelligence available to us if we listen at multiple levels individual right down to listening to the the cells of our body is a good place to start listening to the world listening to people listening to animals um 
So I, I, it, it could be I'm gonna I'm gonna float this as uh, just thought of this maybe maybe the antidote to stupidity is listening, listening long enough and deep enough to find the place where stupidity is not stupid anymore because there's something under there that if we could grab onto and illuminate might wake stupid up in a very powerful way. Bill, you're muted. I came in late, so am I correct in intuiting that I start when I'm ready to start? I was yeah. very impressed that you <laughs> picked up on the protocol, given that yeah. you weren't here when we were sort of figuring that out. So go, go for it. Well done. Well played. I, yeah. I, I was I was listening in the, into the silence. Mm. So um, two things. Um, um, one is that stupid is highly variable. I mean, humans are really there's a wide there's a bell curve let's say of human intelligence uh, and there's always going to be people who are less smart than others in certain ways but the other thing is that there's it's it's not a single variable metric and there's you know there's many different kinds of intelligence and people are smart in one and stupid in another um, we each have our own profiles on that and so um you know, to Ken's evolutionary point, I wonder about not um, not how do we get smarter, but where do we need to get smart? You know, what are the critical adaptive capacities where we as a species or as a as human culture need to get smarter now? Um, so I wonder about that. And Ken, I really like what you said about listening, maybe being the heart of the matter. And it's 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 something that's that listening sounds obvious, but it's not. Uh, there's a lot of subtlety to there. Um, uh, you know, listening is not the same as hearing because uh, it involves constructing meaning, involves actively constructing interpretation and relationship in the act of receiving sound waves. Um, and how to listen to you, not through what I already have and what I already know and what I'm already listening for. Um, I was talking with somebody yesterday and wondering about um, um, how do we say this? You know, to some degree, I'm living in my interpretations of my interpretations of my past. And I'm living in my interpretations of my interpretations of you and my interpretations of your interpretations of me. And all that's in the way of listening in the sense that, Ken, I think you're suggesting it. So it's rich territory. I would love us to come back on, you know, to that particular theme at another call. You know, staying with that thread and doubling down, um, listening is a verb. And um, on the other side of that is the person feeling heard. Um, which is being received. And um, if you listen long enough, and somebody feels heard enough, there is this place that's possible to reach where um, there isn't the there isn't any stupid left. 
not that I necessarily like the idea of imposing or projecting the judgment and that onto anything, but um, whatever the it is that's creating distance and space and um, lack of connection and understanding um, and resonance, um, If 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 I'm willing to invest the time, um, eventually there's a place of an opportunity for connection and for under you know reciprocal and shared understanding, recognition, resonance, respect. And I'm complete with that. What uh, Ken said about listening, I completely agree with and pointed to a thought in my brain about we've been in an epidemic of not listening. And I, to me, deep listening or whatever phrase you want to put around it is one of the remedies to that. And Thich Nhat Hanh is kind of my go-to guy for, for things like that. Uh, and he has a brief passage talking about the five wonderful precepts where one of them is deep listening and loving speech. And a while ago, I made an amateur tour of belief systems, yeah. and I have a I have a trick quiz about the Ten Commandments in Christianity that I use really often. I'll give the TLDR here, which is I ask people, "What is the second commandment?" And freaking one in a hundred people knows what the second commandment is, and they're commandments. There's only ten. They're commandments. They were written on stone tablets. You would think they would be important. You would think they would be memorized or memorizable. Nobody knows the second. The first is, I am your God, your only God. There will be no other gods before me. The second, in most of the Ten Commandment write-ups, because apparently there's a lot of variants, is no graven images. And if you go to any temple or any mosque on the planet, they're obeying number two. If you go to any church on the planet, they are breaking number two every day and twice on Sunday, ironically. Um, and, and it's like, like, what's up with that? So I was looking around for good instructions for building a, a, a good society, and I landed on deep listening and loving speech. And that's my favorite pair of instructions for running a good society, uh, because these are, these are on-ramps to being heard. These are on-ramps to building trust. These are on-ramps to treating one another with respect and maybe seeing um, our interdependence because when you listen deeply, you feel how you and I are connected and what goes between us. All those things become more palpable, more visible. Um, and I think those things are, are awesome. I think that's like a, a great way to go. So, 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 and I'm open to all other uh, suggestions for operating principles. I will point to uh, uh, April took yoga teacher training a couple years ago, and it was actually a really good course. And I basically looked through her notes and started adding things to my brain. And I added the yamas and the niyamas, which are the abstinences and the positive behaviors, which are brilliant instructions for how to live a life and how to be in community. They're really good, non-grasping, aparigraha, go, go, go. Um, there's a whole bunch of, 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 of things that, that are in other, other faith uh, structures that that I like a lot, but uh, but I'd be interested in if other people have uh, their own favorite core nugget beliefs like that. With that, I'm complete. So listening to all of this, my first time here, um, I, I wonder if first how we frame the question and how we all sort of keep saying that maybe it's not about stupid, but then keep referring to stupid. 
Um, and then we keep saying it's about the system, but keep referring to the individuals within the system and um, critiquing parties, individuals, groups. Um, and then we talk about listening and how difficult it is to listen through the lens that we have. Um, and then we keep using that lens in conversation. Um, I wonder if a lot of the difficulty that we have is that we're not really looking at what makes all of this arise. We're looking at what has arisen. And we have a society that we play as a game, that we make the rules of the game. And then when the rules aren't working for us, we all want to change the rules. Um, and then we blame the people who are trying to play within the rules and play uh, and blame the people who are trying to play with outside the rules. But is the question the fact that we are living a game rather than living a natural way of living? And, you know, the ideology of a system like the one we have, I question whether that in itself is part of the problem. And the, the idea that we can see the world through something other than the lens we've been given is even a reality. How do we see things with a language that already defines what we see? How do we see things through a framework of what's right and wrong without the frameworks that preceded us to define what's right and wrong? And so I don't know that we can truly listen without any of that. And I don't think we could look at what's happening in our world without looking at the reality that the system we're all a part of is in itself a game that we've all subscribed to. And that game and the rules we've set up in part define how we see ourselves and each other. Jerry talked about everybody um, pulling for the joystick. Um, that only happens in an environment where we have two party, three party, four party system. And everybody thinks that that's what you're supposed to be doing. And then the way we solve it is, well, let's create another party or, or let's fix the parties we've got. And it's like, wait a minute, it's the game that's the problem, not the players. Because we're not gonna be able to change the players. The only thing we can do is change the game. And the question I've been wrestling with is, is there a way to do it without rules? Is there a way to do society where the game is not based on rules? Because whenever we set up rules, we create another game that's ideological in structure rather than based on our nature. I'm complete. Um, I know only a little bit about anarchism and ar anarchists. Um, the things I think I know about them are that they got written into history as the bad chaotic people. And we don't even we don't even think to look 
uh, behind the curtain of anarchism because that's chaos. Anarchism equals chaos and is going to be the downfall of civilization. Turns out when you pull the curtain back some, what little I've done, you find people who are trying to figure out an answer to the question Jose just posed to us, which is how do you run a healthy society with minimal rules and no big hierarchy and no big two-party system, four-party system, whatever, no fights over the joystick, just how do you create? And, and there are, by the way, many flavors of anarchism. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, let me just uh, uh, share screen real quick because you will be amused. Uh, in my brain, I have collected anarcho-capitalism or ANCAP, which is popular these days, anarcho-communism, pacifism, primitivism, syndicalism, Christian anarchism, collectivist, crypto epistemological, free market individual, insurrectionary, rational relationship anarchy, social anarchism or anarcho-socialism, uh, synthesis anarchism and trenarchists, each of which is connected to something. So here's anarchism without adjectives and a bunch of other things. So you can follow uh, any of those trails uh, down lots of different places. Um, and so I just kind of want to say that, that there's a bunch of people who've done some really creative, uh, fabulous work uh, that is labeled as anarchism. And that one of the tactics one of the tactics in the arena that I was describing earlier or in the cockpit is to demonize the thing that's actually really smart uh, and make sure that nobody goes and inspects it because if they actually inspected it with an open mind, they would be like, well, crap, we should do this. So I just wanted to uh, expand a little on what Jose said, and it's a way of um, kind of walking back from our judgments about uh, <laughs> people that we dislike, because many of them are playing the systemic game that's been set up. <laughs> They're just trying to maximize and do the best they can within the particular game slash um system um people love rules <laughs> that's why people flock to organize religion why and and this is a this is a piece of the epidemic of stupidity they don't want to think for themselves i remember when um obama in one of his campaigns what came out of his mouth was when times are difficult, people turn to organize religion. And he got blasted by it. And all he was saying was that people don't want to think for themselves. You know, so they, 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 they look for a, uh, some kind of a, a, an authoritarian system that will tell them what they can and cannot do. And, and where I think we're pointing at in some ways is a system of values or an articulation of values that is inherent in, um, in human beingness. Inherent in human beingness in its, in, its, in its highest form. Yeah, humans do terrible things, violent things, but there is an aspiration for what we, could and might be. And yeah, I mean, history is filled with, um, with examples of you know, utopian societies of various kinds. Um, but the, the notion of a set of um, values that people um, um, operate under, I think is a, 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 um, much more useful than, than the notion of um, legislation of some kind, because as I said earlier, people will game the system. But right now we have a lot of people just trying to maximize um, their winning within a system without regard to the human value.
Um, I, I think I'm going to disagree a little bit with Stuart on people love rules. Um, I think I think humans love predictability. And predictability and rules are two different things. Um, and if you can offer me predictability, um, then I think I'll follow. <laughs> I'll follow whoever gives me some predictability. But if you're imposing your rules on me and they don't match my predictability of the world, then I'm not so happy. And I think that's what's happening right now the predictability that we offered everybody about what was going to be true about this system and what it was going to do for us and for the world is no longer true. And I think that's, that's really the difference between uh, the idea of rules. And someone said, don't we need rules? And um I'm not suggesting that we need another idealistic way of framing not needing rules um, and that we uh, build a intellectual framework around it per se, uh, but that we recognize that autonomy is an essential part of our lives. And that whenever somebody tries to put their foot on us, what how little or how big we all try to pull away and so how do we find ways to use collaboration as a way to to do things rather than um, the imposition of rules on one another um, to me that that's a big distinction between those those things Done. And just to jump in for one second, and thank you, Jose, uh, what I wanted to say was, it was a beautiful example of collaboration, because as you spoke about rules and predictability, you know, it just, it just, language can be inadequate sometimes, and we need the joint brains that we have to get to the place where we, where we want to get. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So I had planned to read this poem back in January, but things got in the way. <laughs> uh, I chose this poem because I thought it was a really good poem for the start of the year. Um, and then last week we were talking about Black history, so I read, you know, an Etheridge Knight poem, but I wanted to uh, share this with you. It's, it's called My Soul Has a Hat, and I, I really love this poem. My soul has a hat. I counted my years and realized that I have less time to live by than I have lived so far. I feel like a child who won a pack of candies. At first he ate them with pleasure, but when he realized that there was little left, he began to taste them more intensely. I have no time for endless meetings where the statutes, rules, procedures, and internal regulations are discussed, knowing that nothing will be done. I no longer have the patience to stand absurd people who, despite their chronological age, have not grown up. My time is too short. I want the essence. My spirit is in a hurry. I don't have much candy in the package anymore. I want to live next to humans, very realistic people who know how to laugh at their mistakes, who are not inflated by their own triumphs, and who take responsibility for their actions. In this way, human dignity is defended and we live in truth and honesty. It is the essentials that make life useful. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch the hearts of those whom hard strokes of life have learned to grow with sweet touches of the soul. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch the hearts of those whom hard strokes of life have learned to grow with sweet touches of soul. Yes, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to live with the intensity that only maturity can give. I do not intend to waste 
any of the remaining desserts. I'm sure they will be exquisite, much more than those eaten so far. My goal is to reach the end satisfied and at peace with my loved ones and my conscience. We have two lives, and the second begins when you realize you have only one. Mario de Andrade, 1893-1945, to poet, novelist, essay, musicologist, and founder of Brazilian modernism. I got to run. Nice to see everybody. Jerry, can you post the poem or a link to the poem? I just did in the chat. Thank you. It's the lasalette.org strange yeah, link. I just saw it. Yeah, it just yep. came up in chat. Thank you. Yep. Gil, it's up to you to top that. I can't top that. I'll just say that Jerry is very fast. That what what uh, what is? Jerry oh. is very fast. I'm fast. Yes. Well, Pete Kaminsky and I are like little bunnies. We're like boom, boom, boom. No, not as fast as he, but he's not here. So you win the fast prize today. Um, I, 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 Mike just closing is what I stuck in the chat was that we're talking about rules, but uh, it's not clear to me what we mean by rules or differently about rules and norms and customs and um, whatever else I said here, you know, and habits and promises. Uh, and it seems that all of those are oper you know, extant in some way in human societies. Uh, and we're I, we, we're maybe mashing them together and would be useful to untangle them a bit. Uh, there is a thought in my brain. There's things we like and things we don't like, and we give them names and kind of characterize them and uh, lose lose some important distinction. That's it. Thanks, Gil. And we're, we're near the end of our call. Uh, there's a thought in my brain. I just put a link to it. We pass laws and impose rules when discourse fails. But discourse is preferable to laws and rules, in my mind. Spoken like a good anarchist. And I don't know if any of you watched the Warriors and the Blazers play last night. That only happens with rules. No idea what you mean. Basketball. No, I know that they're basketball teams, but I have no idea what happened last night. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. But they, 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 people, people, you know, these, these, these teams went at it for an hour and a half uh, intensely within a framework of rules that was invented, you know, what, 150 years ago by some high school teacher right. who, had, who had kids locked in in bad weather and needed to figure out what he could do to divert them. And he set, up, set out a very, you know, he had 10 commandments, a small set of rules. Um, that organize the energies and those rules have evolved and now we've got what we got and it, it it would you know without the rules it would be a melee with a ball i did a little work in australia a couple of years ago and became a fan of all blacks rugby and rugby is a controlled brawl yeah and it's astonishing it is astonishing that more injuries don't happen but but they're very strict about the rules and it's kind of like really strong gentlemen out on the field it's very strange <laughs> gentlemen in an australian sort of way <laughs> which yeah the word has flex um jose if you want you've got the last word for today's call i i, I agree with gail 100 uh, uh -oh. the the words that we use and how we frame them um has a lot to do with it i think the idea that we can arrive at common understanding of what the norms are um, and that the, these norms uh, evolve through experience um, and, and they work for us and we pass them on to the next generation and so forth until they decide it no longer works for them, um, then that's one thing. But when we impose a, a rule that can't be changed, um, and that I think that's the issue. It's it's how do we create rules? It's the process of the creation of rules, the imposition of rules, and the ability of changing rules. There's a big difference between that and norms. Yep. One of my great sadnesses of uh, the Trump campaign and uh, administration was that he was getting where he was 
getting by breaking norms that were not actually hard and fast rules or laws. And I hate that. You know, uh, it turns out that candidates would publish their taxes. And he was like, nope, not getting my taxes. And then there were lawsuits all the way until now to just try to get Trump's taxes. Well, that was a norm, not a law. And, and that was one of 100,000 that he violated. And he shredded open the Overton window of, of, of acceptable or at least tolerated behavior by breaking all those norms. And so that, that I, don't, I really don't like the effect he had because it seems to say, gosh, we need to pass more laws to force people to do the things that he should have done as a citizen of the country. And, and, and the systems, just to pick up on that, Jerry, and, 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 um, and the systems, as so many, depend upon, you know, voluntary uh, compliance with, quote, what people see as traditional social norms. And then when you get an actor outside the, the norm, like Schmachtenberger said, you're always going to have somebody on the edge. So, you know, this is... Um, this is the human challenge that we that, that we have that, that I think has been with it, with us forever. How do you um, take care of the people who violate the norms? I mean, in the, in 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 many indigenous systems, um, when someone violates the the norms, the majority sees it as oh, we have failed as a society because this person has gone outside of the norms. And what do we have to do to bring them back within the culture and the system? How do we need to heal them so that they will um, operate uh, within the norm so that we can have the kind of social structure that Jose was pointing to? And that we're all, I think, in some ways aspiring to. Or another way of observing that is that we can be irate about Trump breaking all these norms, and I'm going to guess that a lot of us have done a bunch of our lives breaking norms, maybe even have identity. <laughs> um, Mark Carranza, after a pause of your choosing, you will have the last word on this call. I have to run. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Gil's point exactly. As a former, or hopefully former, junkie, from 18 to maybe like 25. Mm -hmm. um, I got used to thinking like a criminal. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly useful um, when I want to get what I want or when I want to get someone else wants. Um, and what can we learn from this breaking of norms? But rather than condemn it, how can we use it to our own advantage for the good? Thank you. Thank you all. See you in a week. Some of you sooner. Thanks, Mark.